I had to begin to focus on what was the solution. That this was not the only place that I'll be able to sell those products. And as I began to challenge myself and got some help and support and some other input, I eventually did. It took longer, but it was challenging. But I did it. Repeat after me, please. No matter how bad it is, <laughs> or how bad it gets, <laughs> I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got that right. Repeat after me, please. It's possible. I can have my dream. I can get what I want. I must be creative and never give up. Now, let me share something else with you, ladies and gentlemen. When you know within yourself that there's something you want to do, and I believe that all of us were born with a purpose, that all of us have something that we are supposed to do, that all of us have some goodness within us, and that goodness gives us a responsibility to manifest our greatness. And when you know that, you can feel it in your guts, and you know that you're deliberately operating below your potential, you've gotten comfortable, you stop expanding, you stop stretching, you stop challenging yourself. Let me share something else with you. Not only is it possible for you to have your dream, but it's it's necessary, it's necessary that you have it, that you work on it, that you develop yourself, that you go for what is yours in the universe. I have a friend that at the beginning of the year I was in Los Angeles giving a speech and, and I do a seminar teaching people how to become involved in the speaking business and, and also one called Speaking with Power, teaching people how to begin to develop their communication skills. And this friend, I said, I want you to work with me. I called her up. She said, Les, are you sure I can do it? Sure you can. You have a PhD in communications. I don't have that. If I can do it, sure you can do it. In fact, I'm going to give you the support that you need. Here's what I realized, ladies and gentlemen. We only have enough energy to take us to a certain level, but it's necessary that we assemble ourselves with other people who share our vision, other people that can see it for us to give ourselves a home court advantage. So it's necessary that you seek out other people who think like you, who are growing, who've decided that they are not satisfied with where they are. See, I don't believe that the necessity, that necessity is the mother invention of invention. No. Necessity, in my opinion, is not the mother of invention. Refusing to accept things the way that they are is the mother of invention. When you decide I'm not going to settle for this, this is not going to be it for my life. I deserve more than this. See, that will start making you do some stuff. See, a lot of people go to work every day miserable and all they do is just talk about how miserable they are, but they don't do anything about it. So I was telling her that I knew she hated a job with a passion. I said, you can do this. You got more going for you than I have going for me. And we've been going through this for years, ladies and gentlemen. She'd been to my seminar speaking for a living. She brought her husband and that was one of the major problems that I realized that happened in her life. He couldn't see it for her. So you gotta make sure that you have people in your life that can see it for you, that will encourage you. Non-affirming relationships can hurt you. And I talked to him. I said, you know, I don't have anything to do with, with your marriage. I said, you and I are good friends and she and I are good friends. And, and I'm not taking sides. I said, but if you can't see it for her, don't tell her that. Just give her some support. What if you're wrong? It's possible, man, that, that if, if I'm doing it, she can do it. Well, you're different. How are you going to tell me that? You've seen her speak. She's got great speaking skills. Don't underestimate her. You don't know. You've got a great woman here. But you see, people who can't see it for themselves can't see it for you. He was happy. So I said, will you do it with me? I said, I'm going to give you the support you need. You can't do it by yourself. I will stand with you. She said, you will? I said, yes. I'm going to make you part of my seminar. You'll do a part of it and I'll do a part of it. Speaking with power. She said, okay. Three days later, ladies and gentlemen, I got an emergency call at my office. It was from a husband. He called and said, tell Les Brown that Marion is dead. I said, oh no. When I was flying there to go to the funeral and I remember the last time that I saw her and I had some of her papers that I had gotten inadvertently confused with mine and I took them home and I was searching through these papers to do one of her works. She was a prolific writer and what got me, what was so sad that made me begin to cry was that there were poems that she had started that were profound poems, great thoughts that she didn't complete. Plays that she had started that she didn't complete. See, that poem was given to her. I can't finish that for her, nor can you. That play, whatever the outcome that she had envisioned, that she had imagined, was given to her only her and that she's the channel that that was going to come through you are here and you are the 
vessel, you are the outlet for the universe, that you've been selected, there's something for you to do. I believe all of us have some purpose for being here. And as I was going to the funeral, and I was reading a newspaper that said that, that millions of people are dying because of, of what they're eating, talking about their diet. And I'm sure that it, it was Marion talking to me, whispering, saying, Les, the next time you speak, say that even more are dying because of what's eating them. Are you ready for something miraculous? One of the little boys that Rod Crew ment mentored was a guy named Conrad, Ro Conrad Rowland. Conrad Rowland was an NFL football player eventually. Rod met him when he was a little boy, the same age when he met me. Conrad was the same age when he met me. And he took an interest in Conrad and believed in him. And Conrad went on to play for the Ravens and other NFL teams. He was in his off season, he was working out at the gym. Rod hadn't seen him in many, many years. He felt a click behind his right eye. He called his brother and said, I think something's wrong. His dad said, I felt, we feared it was an aneurysm. Are you ready? This is a little boy that Rod Crew mentor. At the same time that that happened, Rod had a massive heart attack on a golf course and nearly died. At the same time, he nearly died. Thank God he was on the first hole and they were able to resuscitate him. And he was left with a few days to live. While Rod was in the hospital, Conrad passed away. Conrad donated a heart. Conrad was 29 years old. That heart saved Rod Carew's life and he's still alive today. So the lesson from that is that there's a, there's a payoff, and even if there wasn't, you should do it, but the investment of belief in people, sowing seeds of belief, that's what makes you a leader. People say, what makes me a leader? Makes you a leader is your example. What makes you a leader is you investing belief and loving and caring about people. Any one of you in this moment could decide you're gonna lead, because leadership is instilling something in someone that they don't see in themselves. Loving on them, believing them, seeing their giftedness. All of you, I don't care if you're loud or quiet, big here or small here, you could be a leader. The bottom line is you need to decide you want to lead. You need to decide it's worth it. Our company's looking for leaders, leaders, and it's about your destiny. If you invest in enough people, there's a payoff for your destiny. I'm telling you right now, the more I'm here, the longer I'm here, my heart knows we're a company of destiny. We're a company where dreams come true. We're a company that stands for something. We're a company that changes lives. We're a company where dreams happen for people. You gotta believe that. You gotta believe you got a destiny. I hope you're hearing those people sitting with you saying, you can do this. You belong here. This is where you belong. This is where you can make it. I wanna talk to you about becoming a leader for a second. You gotta feel and know you're gonna lead. It's not just gonna happen, you have to make it happen. A few things you need to know is, listen, no one's gonna do anything for you. Couple rules of being a real leader. You need to take responsibility for your own life. Bring in energy to your team. Leading and recruiting, leading in leadership, leading in growth. Nobody owes you anything, but you owe other people everything. That's what a leader does. You take responsibility. You know exactly right now what you're not doing. It would be criminal of you to leave here and say, I don't know what to do. You know exactly what you're afraid of you know exactly what you've been avoiding and you got to make a decision to change it you know exactly what it is don't bs anybody you know what you need to do different you know the changes you need to make and if you can do that you stop kidding yourself you can win you can overcome your fear overcome procrastination whatever that is you know exactly what it is number two you got to compete i agree with what monty said yesterday you don't have to be number one but dadgummit you better want to compete to be the best version of you you could possibly be your desire and will to win is everything i believe you win with intangible with emotion, with energy, with passion. And you gotta bring that. You know what we're really looking for right here? We're looking for some dogs, man, some road dogs. We're looking for some people that wanna get aggressive. How many road dogs we got out there? You know what I mean, right? I hear, I hear ladies go sometimes, some of the guys here, well, I don't know if I got a road dog in me. Ladies, let me tell you something. The hardest core road dogs in the world are women. Hey, ladies. Here's how we know. What if someone mess with your kid at school? You know how you get? You slap the hell out of a little kid if you have to, don't you? You don't give a crap. Well, guess what, ladies? Listen to me. You're letting the world slap the hell out of your family, and you're not doing anything about it. You're letting life slap the hell out of your kids and you. You're settling for average, aren't you? You're settling for ordinary, aren't you? See, you may not see the slap, but you can feel it. You need to stop letting the world slap your family around. It's time that stops right now. You say, that's the end of this. This family wins now. I'm leading this family. Change Change happens now, say yes. Stop letting people hold you to your past. Yeah, man, I got what I used to do, but I'm trying to do better now. Stop letting people tie you to what they saw you do five, ten years ago. You can go on the internet and say whatever you want to say about me in the past. Got all that. Was who I was, but I am who I am, and I'm cool with both of them people. You got to be not all right to get all right. You got to be lost to get saved. You got to have been through something to know something. 
So please, get comfortable with that put. Get, get comfortable with that part. I don't know what I'm doing on time, so I'm just going to go ahead. Okay, cool. Here we go. This is the one I really wanted to do because this one describes my life to the T. When I left college, I flunked out of college after three years. When I worked at Ford Motor Company, one of the last jobs I had because of the layoffs was they put me in the foundry. I learned a valuable lesson in the foundry because I used to be a foundry worker at Ford Motor Company. I'm now a spokesperson for Ford. Let me tell you how the flip went. A lot of people don't know, but in the foundry, they was making engine blocks. Engine blocks start with scrap metal. See, people, you think old cars just go away. No, they go to junkyards. Companies take this scrap metal and they melt the metal down. But it starts with scrap. They run it through a furnace, and when it gets in the furnace, they liquefy the metal. Then they take this metal and they pour it into a mold. This mold is the engine block. But when you pour it in there, it's just hot. It's just hot. It ain't nothing. And you think that you can't do nothing with that. But then and something comes along and gets a hold of it. Something comes and gets a hold of it. It takes this hot piece of mess that was scrap. It lifts it. It dips it. It cools it. It refinishes it. It hardens it. And then it puts it on a conveyor belt. When it come out the conveyor belt, my job was to hit it with a sludge hammer and knock the loose flashing out. That's empty, extra metal on it. And then you have an engine block. The basic of any engine is the block. You got a cracked block, you can throw that engine away. It don't work. But the block starts from scrap metal. This really how God do it, though. See, God takes scrap. All engine blocks is scrap. He takes scrap. He molded it. He pour into it. Then he come out, he cool it. He shape and he start putting stuff on it. He start attaching pieces to it. He put a manifold on it. He put the rocker arm on it. He put the exhaust on it. He put spark plugs on it. He put a carburetor on it. He put a fan belt, water pump, and he take it and he put it in a car. But all of it started when it was a piece of scrap metal, man. We cannot do as Christians. It's just cause we the car now. You can't look at the dude that's in the furnace that's got that's just wet liquid. That's a hot mess. You can't look back at the scrap pile and go, they just scraps, man. Because what you don't understand is you got to have that scrap so you can make a block so God can put stuff on it. So when you put it on it, you can be a car one day. I just want everybody to let everybody be a block, man. Let them be a hot mess in a furnace. Let them be a scrap, man. You ain't got nothing to do with that. That's God right there, man. That's all I'm trying to say. That's all. You got to get ready mentally. And this is where Shope went to work on me, to be ready mentally, to develop the philosophy and also be able to defend your virtues and your values. Let's go through it. You need a good library. Shope got me started on my library. Here's one of the books he recommended. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Think and Grow Rich. Shope said to me, doesn't that book title intrigue you? Think and Grow Rich. Don't you have to read that book? Think and Grow Rich. I said, yes, sir by Napoleon Hill. I went and found that book in a used bookstore. That's where I had to start. In a used bookstore. I paid less than 50 cents for it. I've still got it. It's one of the rare hardback covers. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Wow, Shof was right. Get a library started. It'll change your life. Any home over $200,000 has got a library. Why do you suppose that is? Wouldn't that make you curious? How come every home over $200,000 has got a library? Does that tell you something? Does that educate you at all? You say, well, I can't afford a $200,000 home. It doesn't matter what size home. Take your present apartment, clean out a closet, call it your library, and start acting intelligent. <laughs> and start this process like I did. Start developing a library. Here's what your library needs to show, that you're a serious student of health and life, spirituality, culture, uniqueness, sophistication, economics, prosperity, 
productivity, sales, management, skills, values of all kind. Let your library show you're a serious student. Don't be casual in learning. Don't be lazy in learning. Information is the key. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. Learning is the beginning of prosperity. Learning is the beginning of democracy, the beginning of freedom. All values, all virtues start with the learning process. So don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in gathering the library that'll teach you and instruct you. And I got that book, Think and Grow Rich. Some of the ideas in that book inspired me no end, helped me to change my life. Now it's got some weird stuff in it. You know, it's got some weird stuff. Napoleon was weird. So you gotta <laughs> separate out a little of this weird stuff, but you can do that. You can separate out the weird stuff, okay? Unless you're weird, just do the weird stuff. <laughs> anyway, remember, don't be a follower, be a student. That's the key to all books. Don't be a follower, be a student. Another book he recommended, Help Me Become Financially Independent. We're going to cover that before we finish this afternoon. The book was entitled, The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson, C-L-A-S-O-N. This little book, The Richest Man in Babylon, I use it as a textbook teaching teenagers how to be rich by 40, living in America. 35 if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. I got rich by the time I was 31, didn't wait till 35. If you find a unique opportunity. So we'll get into that after we come back from our next break. Richest Man in Babylon, get your library started. Here are some key sections to put in your library called mental food. In fact, we call it food for thought. It's so important to nourish the mind, not just the body, but nourish the mind. Key phrase. Now it needs to be well balanced. You can't live on mental candy. Somebody says, well, I just read this positive stuff. That's too second grade. You've got to get out of second grade. You can't just be inspired. You've got to be taught. You can't just be inspired. You've got to be educated. Key. Here's a good book. It's called How to Read a Book. Good title. How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. In this book, How to Read a Book, Mortimer, you know, is the, is the chief editor of the new Encyclopedia Britannica. A good set of books, right, to have in your library. Encyclopedia Britannica, chief editor, Mortimer Adler. He's still in, he's in his 80s. He's still active, still writing books. I've got several of his books, The Six Great Ideas, a lot of books, Mortimer Adler. But he wrote this book, How to Read a Book. Now, in this book, How to Read a Book, not only does he give you some good suggestions on how to get the most out of a book. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to get the best out of it. He'll give you some techniques on how to get the best out of a book. It's very good. But here's what's also in his book, How to Read a Book, a list of what he calls the best writings ever written, the best writings ever written. I've used it as a centerpiece for my library. So I'm just asking you, take a look. If it suits you, fine. If it doesn't suit you, hey, keep looking until you find something to suit you. But well balanced. Let me give you some of that balance. Number one, history. We've all got to have a sense of history. American history, national history, international history, family history, political history. We all need a sense of history. Shortest history lesson. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. No matter how far back you go, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand, four thousand years ago, I'm telling you, it all reads the same. Once you understand the thread that it isn't going to change, then what's going to change for my life? Answer. Looks like I'm going to have to change. History helps us to understand how it is, what there is to work with, seed, soil, sunshine, rain, and what human beings have done with it in the past, and how many of them have, like I did by age 25, they have messed up. That's what history's for. Be a good student of history. Here's a good book, Lessons of History by Durant. Lessons of History by Durant. This little book is only 100 pages, but I'm telling you, it's so well written, you'll be intrigued as I was. This little book, Lessons of History by Durant. Next is philosophy. Durant also wrote a good book on philosophy. The story of philosophy. It's got a good rundown of the key philosophers of the last several hundred years, what they taught and some of the lives they lived. You might find it a little difficult, but hey, you can't just read the easy stuff. Key phrase to add here in parenthesis, don't just read the easy stuff. You won't grow, you won't change, you won't develop. Tackle the more difficult stuff. Next, novels. Novels are good. Sometimes an intriguing story keeps our attention so that the author can weave in the philosophy he or she is trying to get across. Anne Rand was probably better at that than anybody else I could possibly think of. Atlas Shrugged, some of those towering novels. The novel kept us intrigued, but guess what she was doing all the time? Feeding us her philosophy, feeding us her philosophy. Now, whether you agreed with her philosophy or not, you had to admit she was really good at getting it out there, weaving it through the story, in the dialogue and in the speeches and in the text. That is novel. Novels are good. Now, here's a little personal advice. Skip the trash. You know. Somebody says, well, sometimes you can find something valuable in a trashy novel. I wouldn't go through it to find it. You can find a crust of bread in a garbage can, but I wouldn't go through it. <laughs> Number one, you don't need the reputation. 
So not enough time to read the brilliant stuff, the good stuff. Skip the trash. Really, my personal advice on personal development: becoming more valuable than you are. What feeds that hunger? You've got to develop a sense of urgency. Aurelia said, "Stop living your life like you have a thousand years to live. In life, you're either here today and you're gone today. If there's something that you want to do and you can't do it all at one time, do just a little bit of it. I like what Robert Shuler says. He said, 'By the yard, it's hard, but inch by inch, anything is essential.' Do just a little bit of it. A friend of mine, Bobby Kerr, used to be a roommate. Bobby wanted to go into the area of public relations." He loved working with the public. Young lady he wanted to marry named Clarice. Bobby was a great procrastinator. Pretty soon, the job where Bobby worked, they transferred him to another location. He went out to celebrate with the people on that new job site, and Bobby suffered a massive heart attack and died. Bobby didn't drink and didn't smoke. Was under forty, and he died. Ask your question: How much time do you have left? How much time do you have left? When you start thinking about that, we don't know. We don't know. Bobby took all the greatness and all of the talent and all of his abilities to his grave with him. One of the things he could have put in parentheses under his name, he didn't use all his stuff. 
Most of, most of us do that. Most of us don't use the stuff that we have brought into the universe. And we want to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to start living life with a sense of urgency and using what we've got, using ourselves up, sharing what we brought into the universe to share. Because if we don't, nobody else will. Stop wasting valuable time knowing that if we begin to live our lives as if each day were our last, our lives will take a, take on a whole new meaning and take on a whole new expression, valuing each moment that we are blessed with. So many questions are not a matter of morality. It's a question of being careless or careful, being cautious rather than reckless, but not too cautious. So it's kind of an interesting challenge. If you were so cautious driving on a two-way highway, every time a car came your way, you were troubled about thinking whether or not he was going to stay on his side of the line, that you pulled off the road, wait for him to pass, then got back on the road and continued your journey. We would call that a bit too cautious. It may take you two, three days to get to your destination. So you say somehow when the traffic's coming your way on a two-way highway, you must trust at least the law of averages that says, I have a pretty good chance of arriving, even though there's not a guarantee that one out of a thousand coming my way, I'll cross the line and it'll be the end. So we do have to be cautious, but not too cautious, and let those daily experiences lead us into a better life, a better month, a better year. I arrived on an airplane flight once, and the flight attendant came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, you have now completed the the safest part of your journey. From now on, it gets dangerous. Fasten your seatbelt. I thought that was interesting. You've now completed the safest part of your journey. According to statistics, for the miles covered, it's the safest way to go.
the very first thing I said to you, I asked you was what? Good, what are you here for? Right, because there's a difference between a man and a woman who, who's living for something versus a man and a woman who's not living for something. Right, so I want you to study. Man, I wish I had the research up here, but there's research that proves that people who have a sense of purpose outlive people who don't have a sense of purpose. Right? I've shared this with you before, but if you had a brand new car and you sit that car in the garage for a year, do you know that car is not going to be as effective and as efficient as a car you put on the road? Because a car wasn't designed to do what? Sit. It erodes when it sits. Uh, you missed what I said. You think by using it, you damage it. No, you're really damaging it by not using it. You let gas just sit in the car for a year, you know what happens? You let oil just sit in the car, you know what happens? But that same oil that's in the car, that's moving and running, it's a different oil. That gas is being used, it's a different gas. And most of you are not where you want to be, not because you don't have the ability to be there, but you're not doing nothing. And every time you sit and waste and do nothing, you are eroding your success, you are eroding your abilities, you are eroding your gifts. But when you use them, I didn't start doing voiceover work. I didn't start doing videos. I started with a GD program. And in the GD program, I would give kids work, but before I gave them their work, I would do what? I would motivate them. I would, mo I'm sorry, I went too far. Before I started motivating kids, I started reading personal development books. And then the books I started reading, I gave to them. And then I started motivating them from the books. And I went from teaching a GD class to coming to Michigan State and doing the advantage. And the advantage is where all my videos blew up. The guru story, that wasn't in a big auditorium like this. I don't know if y'all saw the guru story, but that wasn't, that was in a normal classroom. We didn't start here with all of y'all. We started with 30, 40 kids, but we started. And by starting, it turned into this. Your problem is you haven't started. Write down right now what you should have started that you didn't start. And remember what I said, don't give me a passive start. Give me an aggressive start. What haven't you started aggressively? Let me hear it real quick. Somebody be honest. What haven't you started aggressively? What have you started, but you haven't started aggressively? Let me hear it. Yes, ma'am. Say it again. Caring. I love it. Caring about everything. Come on, let's just be real. How many of y'all just real? Like, you're going through the motions, but like, you ain't really caring about what you're doing. Let me see your hand. Be honest. I love it. Thank you for being transparent. So we need to start with what? You need to care about what you're doing. Put something in it. Put some effort into it. Good. What else? What else have we been passive about? Yes, ma'am. Waking up at 4 a.m. Yep, most of us have been passive about waking up at 4 a.m. Absolutely. Why 4 a.m.? Mm. Write that down even if you ain't ready. I need to start my day before I start my day. Some of y'all just waking up and starting the day. It just hit you. You coming right into the day. <laughs> like you right in the day. <laughs> like boom. <laughs> you, can, you ain't got time to get ready. I told my wife, I woke up at six o'clock this morning. I stayed up late last night, got up at three, but was like, okay. No, I got up at two something. That's what threw me off. I got up at two something, got up, did my thing. and was like, yo, I don't usually get up to three. This two something, I might be a little too early. You know what I'm saying? Went back to sleep, got up, it was six. I couldn't do the stuff that I normally do because I had to start work at seven so I wasn't even able to like go into my day I didn't go in with prayer I didn't work out I didn't do the stuff that I do I had to brush my teeth take a shower I had to get on the beginning of the call and then boom we had the podcast right after two episodes back to back then after that we went out to eat then I had to come back and do stuff my whole day was ruined my whole day was ruined you understand what I'm saying? Then, then I messed up, hit a pothole, didn't even see the pothole. Now I got to stand in line at discount tire. I think I'm doing something by getting there at eight. Me and everybody else had the same idea. Am I, am I lying, Nikki? I get to eight o'clock in the morning. It's a line all the way. I'm like, everybody got the same idea? We all hit the same pothole? Was that a setup? <laughs> we all right here. I'm talking about, I'm literally like, I'm, I'm at discount tire. It's like a football game. It was about 12 dudes that was discount tire. They all running, get zoom, zoom, zoom. They starting off with like 10 cars. I'm like, it's unbelievable. They're standing like, like we stood in line for about 10 minutes. Nobody even came to us because they was doing tires. I told Carl, I was like, yo, Carl, next lick, we open up a discount tire, bro. <laughs> this joker, they making bread, bro. They getting paid. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. It's about 40 cars outside. Then me and my wife just want to go pick up our car. I was like, yo, it's 6 o'clock. We got to go get our car. I get there at 6. It's a line inside. And it's cars. I said, what time you close? They said, when we finish the last car. I said, what time are you going to be finished with my car? They said, about an hour and a half. I'm like, I'm buying a discount tire. <laughs> Y'all busy at 8. 
In the morning, y'all busy at 6 o'clock at night. I need a discount tire. Somebody getting paid this joint. Good, talk to me. What else are we passively doing? What else are we passively doing? Come on, talk to me. I need two more people to be honest. Good, starting a nonprofit. Good. How long have you been thinking about doing it? Three years now. So write down the thing that you said you was going to do that you haven't done yet. Write it down. And what I want you to do is I want you to write it down every day and talk to somebody about it every single day until you get tired of talking about what you said you was going to do. Don't, whatever, listen to me. Do me a favor. This is how life going to try to punk you. Life is going to tell you you've been talking about that too much. Shut up and don't say nothing else about it. My first book, which is still selling on the shelf. The secret to success is still selling. Matter of fact, somebody said the other day, this is crazy. There's a young lady who volunteered for us. I'm not lying. I thought she was lying. I don't know if you remember this, Valerie. I thought she was lying. She said, if you go online and try to buy that book, it's $69. I said, what? I'm about to start selling the few we got. <laughs> I said, $69. She said that there are people who are selling that book for $69 because you can't go to a bookstore and grab it. That was the first book I ever wrote. Guess how many years it took me from start to completion to do that book? 10 years. Took me 10 years, but you know what I never stopped doing? I never stopped telling people I was gonna write a book. And my homies would be like, yo, E, you said you was gonna finish that book five years ago. You said you gonna finish six years ago. You said you gonna finish seven years ago. You said you gonna finish eight years ago. And you know what that did? When they kept saying that, guess how I felt when they kept saying that? Got on my nerves. I said, one of these days, I'm gonna shut your mouth. One of these days, I'm gonna shut. So, so do me a favor, don't go. You embarrassed about it. You don't want nobody to know about it. Don't do that. Keep saying you're gonna do it so people can hold you accountable. Because one day it's gonna be the, come on, one day it's gonna be the, Good. One day it's going to be the We Lost to Dolly Parton is the number one book in audio book. Audio book still going. Guess what? That, we still getting money every month. We still getting a check every month off the audio book. People love. I be having kids all the time. I don't like to read. Okay, listen to the audio book. They're like, oh, the audio book. It was like a movie. We got the creaking on the floor. I'm walking up the stairs. You can hear the creak. The line, you can roar. You can hear when I was homeless, the leaves. I'm, so, I'm, I'm telling y'all, like, that sucker's so sweet, you can hear me wink. <laughs> they got that sucker so I go, wow, you can hear that joker. One of the best books, and we're still getting a check from it. But guess what? It took me 10 years. If I would have stopped at 8, we would have never got a check from it. If I would have stopped at 9, I would have never got a check from it. So don't let nobody fool you. Whatever it is you say you're going to do, just keep saying it out loud. Because one of these days, we're going to talk, and you're going to be like, yo, E, can you come speak for the nonprofit? I'm going to be, you finished it? For free. Just get a couple books. You know what I'm saying? Buy a couple books. <laughs> Give out to the kids. Now you hear what I'm saying. So, so do me a huge favor. Don't stop saying it. How long did it take me to get my first degree? 12 years. How long did it take? 12 years. How long did it take? What's the, what's the, what, what is the year that most people, if they don't get their degree, they stop? What year is the year? Because it's not four, but what's the year that if you're working on it and you don't get it, when do most people stop at what year? Year six is where most people quit. You should, you should write this down every day. This year is either going to be better for me or it's going to be worse for me. How many couples in the room? How many married couples in the room? You, th my marriage is either going to get better this year or it's going to get worse. My money is going to get better or it's going to get worse. My health is going to get better or my health is going to get worse. What I do today will determine whether it's going to be better or whether it's going to be worse. It will not be up to Trump. It will not be up to the Democrats. It will not be up to, to, to something that happens in Iran. It won't be up to the stock market. It's up to you. Okay. You guys want it to be better or worse? How much better? 10x better, baby. 10x. You don't want it to be a little better. You need to start thinking like this. Okay. First, get rid of the little think and the old ideas. And the middle class mentality, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to save some money, I'm going to put it in the bank, I'm going to give it to the man. What's the bank do? The bank doesn't even keep your money. They hate money. Cash is, it's trash. Cash is garbage, it's pieces of garbage paper. It is only useful when it is used, if you're taking notes. They didn't teach you this in school. This should have been taught basic, fifth grade, sixth grade, not in, not when in high school or college. Cash, this is a piece of paper, okay? It is a piece of paper, it's worthless. This is a piece of paper. This actually has more value. This piece of paper right here has more value than this piece of paper right here. Why? Because one person has this piece of paper. 2,000 people have this data. 
You understand? This piece of paper right here is useless though, until it is used. How many of you were taught to save stuff? How many of you got sticky notes and you save them? You write, you write like 17 different things on one sticky note. I don't, I don't want to use the whole pad. I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this sticky pad last the rest of my life. Okay. You got to get rid of the little think folks. This little think is killing you. Let's find out if you got the little think. How many believe success is a mind game? Dude, it starts right here. You got to fix this. You got to get rid of, let's find out if you've been affected.